Welcome to Word on the Block, the series that takes a deeper dive into the emerging technologies that shape our world. AI, IoT, blockchain, cryptography, cryptocurrency, all of it. You can even include DLT at the intersection of business, politics, and economy. I'm your editor-in-chief, Forecast News, Angie Lau, and your host, and welcome to the show. I'd like to welcome right now, we've got two very... Uh, timely guests, I'd like to say. Naveen Gupta and Sagar Sarbhai, they're with Ripple Asia. And between the two of them, they've got the regulatory uh, and the uh, policy <laughs> guidance uh, really, really in check across the region, uh, south, from Southeast Asia to Singapore to India. But right now, we'd like to focus on India. It's a very timely issue here uh, because at this moment, at this juncture, it really does seem that India uh, is, you know, at a crossroads a little bit. You know, Naveen um, uh, Sagar, we both know that India for the past decade, uh, we've, been, we've been talking endlessly about its economic potential, a potential that has yet to be realized. I think politically, we've seen just the, the roller coaster um, and, and the passion of, of its people to really strive to the kind of political and economic potential that everyone believes in, a country of 1.35 billion people. Uh, where are we today when it comes to blockchain and digital assets? I want to start with you, Sagar, because we've got word now that potentially uh, policymakers are, are looking into filling the void that the Supreme Court of India has left wide open, uh, essentially uh, tearing down the RBI ban on banking for uh, cryptocurrency or digital asset uh, firms. Um, Kind of bring us up to speed as to what you're seeing and, and where um, India is right now and how it needs to think through all of this. Thanks, Andy. Firstly, uh, thank you so much for having us both here. It's, it's a pleasure to be uh, speaking with you. Uh, let, me, let me take you and your audience back into time uh, to 2013 where all this started. Uh, so in 2013 early, uh, RBI and the Ministry of Finance in India was still trying to figure out what cryptocurrency, digital assets, blockchain was all about. And I think back in the days, there was still that very negative perception about cryptocurrencies and digital assets globally. Uh, and that triggered a lot of warnings coming in from RBI. They said that, look, there are, we see risks and major concerns with cryptocurrencies and digital assets. So you are advised to take precautions. Uh, and these were warnings which, which kept coming out from 2013 to 2017. RBI, Ministry of Finance, senior ministers in the government came out with these warnings. Uh, and then in 2018, uh, RBI circulated a circular to all their regulated institutions, kind of saying, telling them that you are not allowed to offer services to cryptocurrency digital asset service providers. And that effectively led to a, a quasi ban on, on trading of cryptocurrencies and digital assets. Uh, and then over the next two years, a uh, uh, legal battle ensued in the, in the Supreme Court. And, uh, and then this year, earlier this year, the Supreme Court actually came up with a, with a judgment saying that the ban was indeed unconstitutional and lifting the ban. So that was a huge positive for the industry. But that being said, uh, the re digital assets regulations in India are still in a gray zone. There is no framework in place that will give that comfort level to banks and institutional investors to enter this space and provide services. I think that is where we believe there is scope for more clarity coming from the government and the, and the regulators. And we are hoping that uh, in the, this year or by early next year, there will be some sort of guidance coming in. That being said, last fortnight, there was a report uh, in, in Indian media which said that the government had actually moved a note to potentially looking at a uh, uh, a permanent ban on trading of cryptocurrencies. Now, while that may or may not be true, the good news is that at least this topic is now being broadly discussed in the policy circles in India. For a long, long time, the topic of digital assets was in a policy vacuum. So it's, it's good news that now people are talking about it, people are discussing about it, it's all over mainstream media. And I think that, that to me is, a, is good news because we believe that to take any step, any action, 
the most important thing for a regulator to do is to consult public and the stakeholders. And in India, there has been a wealth of uh, precedents in the recent political policy and financial and technology policy history, where Indian policymakers have taken a very uh, forward thinking approach of consulting the stakeholders in public, be it your data privacy bill or the bankruptcy code or the most recent net neutrality discussion that happened in India. In all these discussions, policymakers took a view of consulting stakeholders. And I think we, we really now want and urge policymakers in India to take a similar uh, thoughtful approach when it comes to digital assets cryptocurrencies. So there's a framework, as you said, there's a policy framework, there's precedence, there's, there's history that, you know, when it comes to other emerging technologies or other initiatives or innovations, policymakers in the past have consulted with the private sector and the public sector alike. Um, you know, so the chance of this happening uh, for cryptocurrency and DLT and blockchain uh, stand a very, very good chance. But Naveen, you, you, you spent a lot of time in Mumbai. What's the buzz? What's the energy right now? Is there concern uh, that the policymakers either get it? What are the conversations that you're having? Yeah, so I think from my point of view, what I can see is, um, firstly, there is a lot of confusion within the government to say who owns this. Right? Is it the RBI that owns it? Is it SEBI that's owned it? Does the Ministry of Finance owns it? Like who's the owner who will make the decision or who's the one who will get everybody together for the decision to be made, right? So that's one. The hmm. second thing is for the last two years, there also has been narrative in India, blockchain good, digital asset bad, right? And, what, and, and in our mind, it's very clear, this needs to be looked together. Blockchain without digital asset is just a database which may or may not serve the problems that India is looking to solve, right? And then the third thing is that we need to give clear signal to foreign investors, right? So if there are investors who are coming into India expecting that there is no law against trading cryptocurrencies or digital assets, then we owe it to these investors to give them a clear guideline whether you can do this or not. And clearly, because this issue has been in discussion for quite some time, and as you know, India is the fifth largest GDP in the world, it received 79 billion US dollar just in remittances from overseas. So the buzz on the ground is state of confusion. That's what I would say. And hence, mm. it's very important for India to come out of this fog and essentially say, hey, you know what? This is the lead regulator. This is how the consultation process would work. And this is when and how we are going to make a decision. And we want to incorporate everybody's views and then make the decision that's best for India. And that's what the individuals, institutions, and the investors are looking for. Nothing more. Well, as we all know, politics can make messy bedfellows, uh, unfortunately. And authorities uh, recently in India have announced that all foreign investment would be screened, which essentially would mean delays. That's the kind of message that's being sent out to foreign investors right now. So, Naveen, I just, I'm curious, can you give us an overview of the venture capital market in India? What's the appetite that you're feeling for blockchain in the digital asset space, uh, both domestically and foreign inbound? So definitely I can speak about the blockchain and the digital asset space. For that, in, there is no other market like India, right? Uh, even if we look before 2007, if you look at the ban, the crypto market in India was doing very well. Very large amount of trading used to happen in India. If you look at reports in the last three months, exchanges that are in India are reporting increased volume. Recently, we had Binance and a number of other institutional players making a play for India who are present globally but now want to invest in India as well, right? India, like I said, is a 79, received 79 billion US dollars in remittances. So we are very excited about India, for example, to bring our on-demand liquidity into India, which essentially lowers the cost of remittances for everybody. So as you know, there are about 35 million Indians who live overseas and mm. they send very huge amount of money into India. And on, on an average, they pay 7% of the principal, principal value that gets taken away every time they remit money into India. And we want to make it easier, faster, better, and cheaper for them. And that would not be possible uh, without using digital assets. And we are waiting for this regulatory clarity to then introduce this solution into India. And I think there are many more like us, right? For, uh, for us and all the others, investment is not an issue. But the key issue is without a regulatory, clear regulatory signals, we can't move ahead. 
And that's something that uh, Ripple Asia, that Cigar, you, you helped lead uh, the policy paper, um, you know, hoping to really lay out, uh, you know, piece by piece what policymakers and legislators really need to consider. But I wanted to focus on uh, digital asset space, because this is a really exciting space for India. It allows the middle class and uh, upper uh, income uh, citizens to really participate in a part of the economy that they might not have, especially if you take a look at securitized tokens, perhaps if you take a look at the real estate market, for example. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's been said that uh, land rights are at the center of all scandals in India. And, and I guess, uh, you know, even if a fraction of that were true, um, you know, this is a huge market that can actually uh, be cleaned up and given access to a lot of people, especially with a population of 1.35 billion, you know, middle class to be able to participate in a meaningful and transparent way. Where are policymakers there? Where are industry giants here when, when it comes to thinking about the digitalization of traditional assets? Yeah. So uh, as Naveen mentioned uh, earlier, uh, for a long, long time, the narrative in India has been blockchain, good, crypto, bad. And, and the idea behind this paper was to define and highlight why the two go together, why the two go hand in hand. So really what we wanted to do was lay out solid use cases of digital assets with blockchain. So prime examples being micropayments or cross-border payments, how digital assets could be used potentially as uh, a bridge currency between two fiats to make cross-border payments very efficient. You mentioned about securitization. That was one, one more use case, which, uh, which we wanted to highlight. Uh, so that was the, the first line of thinking. The second line of thinking was we wanted to, there has been a lot of discussion around what a good regulatory framework should look like. We have talked about the, the high level principles. Let's say the framework should be technology agnostic. It should be principles based and not rules driven, and it should be risk proportionate. Uh, so the industry has been talking about those kind of very high level concepts for a long, long time. But we wanted to give a very detailed blueprint to the regulators. We wanted to talk mm -hmm. about what other countries have done around taxonomy, for example, because again, as Naveen mentioned, there has been a lot of confusion in India around who will own this space, whether it would be the securities regulator SEBI or whether it would be the central bank RBI or possibly a new agency. So we wanted to lay out our recommendations, taking cues from some of the more forward thinking regulators like the UKFCA, the Monetary Authority of Singapore, and the kind of steps they have taken. So taxonomy being one. Then we talked about some short-term low-hanging fruits. So one example we gave was how can, so India has a free trade zone called Gift City, and that's in the state of Gujarat. So we suggested that maybe you can look at Abu Dhabi global markets in UAE, which is a similar free trade zone. And they actually introduced a very thoughtful framework for digital assets uh, outside of the UAE central bank regime. So we kind of proposed that you can take cue from that and maybe in the short term, allow cryptocurrency trading to be done within that free trade zone. Uh, then there were other uh, measures such as uh, introduce, allowing crypto-based use cases to be included in Reserve Bank of India's regulatory sandbox. Uh, that again could be a low-hanging fruit. And then the yeah. paper talks about more mid to long-term solutions like what are the specific legislations and regulations that need to be amended uh, to include, to have a conducive framework for digital assets. The key among them being empowering the uh, securities regulator SEBI to uh, regulate and license digital asset exchanges and custodians. But how does that policy, and Naveen, maybe I'll ask you this as a follow-up, you know, how do these inform your conversations, for example, uh, you know, real estate? Let's just, let's just talk about some, uh, you know, real use, uh, real world uh, possible uh, applications there. You know, you've got the uh, stakeholders, uh, the institutional bodies like the Real Estate Regulatory Authority, insurance regulators. Uh, are, are these bodies actually thinking about it? Are they having conversations with you about it? How how are they thinking about this holistically? Right. And I'll even take a much simpler use case than real estate. So let's look at the yoga market globally, right? The yoga, yoga market. To, that's right. Namaste. Yoga is to India. Yeah, absolutely. Yoga is to India what pizza is to Italy, right? So, I mean, of course, yoga came from India and there is a great respect for a lot of people in India who can teach yoga. 
and we know we are all digital now, right? So it's fairly easy for, uh, so yoga market globally is about 100 billion US dollar plus, right? So let's assume Angie wanted to learn yoga and she says, hey, you know what, there are 100 trial teachers in India. Let me pick up a person who already has a website, has got certain certifications in yoga, and you wanted to take a trial class. Everything is possible over Zoom. Everything is possible digitally. The only problem is that Angie cannot transfer 100 Hong Kong dollars from her account in Hong Kong to the yoga teacher in India. That's the biggest issue that today stands in the way for millions of yoga teachers in India to essentially be commercially available to people all over the world who want to learn. And this was the main idea behind yoga itself, that it should be available to anybody who wants to learn. So the medium is there, but the payment system or the cross-border system that essentially stops them because the friction is so high. So to my mind, in some way, India is un underliving its potential mm. with not enabling these new technologies to come in to solve decade-old problems. And these can be done legally. These can be done in a very regulated manner in which uh, when uh, crypto onboards onto an exchange, full AML and KYC can be performed. And similarly, when somebody sells it, full, full a AML and KYC can be performed. So within the regulatory framework itself, if there could be um, uh, innovation that could be available to India and we are not providing them the tools or the policymakers are not providing them the tool, then in some way we are crippling innovation, right? And yoga is just one example, but there are tons of others which India could, India could provide to the world, but we are not able to. And we have had these discussions. So when we have this yeah. discussion at an individual level, right? So 101, and I give the same yoga example to anybody at the policy, they totally agree. But somewhere there is a disconnect in terms of everybody getting together, making it a priority to say this needs to be solved and the right decision needs to be taken. Yeah. I mean, one yoga on one hand and then DeFi uh, as a potential uh, at the other. And, and uh, India could it truly uh, be an um, innovation leader in, in this aspect. And yet... Um, I guess at the end of the day, we're still just really waiting for regulatory guidance and policy guidance from uh, Indian lawmakers. Absolutely. And also, if you look at just the nature of India itself, India is a land driven by entrepreneurs, right? I mean, if you look at the, the internet industry, uh, that means in, in 1999, when Infosys, I mean, you name it, the top outsourcing companies in India essentially rose from India. And these were all entrepreneurs who essentially brought the new industry to life for the, for, for the greater good of the country. And India has got so much of entrepreneurial spirit and all they need is clear regulatory policies for then a lot of these entrepreneurs to then build their business models on the top of it. And I wouldn't be surprised if there are thousands of companies, entrepreneurs who today are in the gig economy, who are building business models, they're waiting for, for the, the policy clarity to be, to, to be there, then to be able to offer goods and services to people around the world. I mean, if we were to do a back of the envelope calculation, what, what would you say is the pent up demand of entrepreneurs waiting to unleash their entrepreneurialism from you know, goods and services to digital assets and everything in between, if the policymakers were clear and specific about uh, blockchain and cryptocurrency? I think the easiest way for me to think about it would be there are about 20 to 25 million developers in the world, right? Roughly, like coders, people who code, provide codes, right? And I can think of each individual person almost as an entrepreneur in himself or herself because each coder can essentially say, hey, you know what, here's an idea. They code, put up a website, and their goods can get sold, or the information can be available to uh, 7 billion people around the world, including India. Right. Now, majority of these coders are in India, almost nine to 10 million coders out of this 20 to 25 million population are in India. So there is a huge potential to my mind, sky is the limit. So if you look at even the gig economy figures, people who outsource and do coding, do presentations, do logo designing, there is a very significant number who come from India who essentially say, hey, Angie, you need a logo design. It is two hours of my work. And yes, for 200 Hong Kong dollars, I'm happy to do it for you on my part time on a Sunday. So there is, of course, clearly a very large formal economy, but there is a very large, um, you can call it a, a gig economy that is in parallel. And if I look at going forward, maybe the formal economy will not grow so, so big or it will not grow so fast, but it will be the gig economy that takes off and it provides uh, employment to people. 
And for that, the cross-border payments absolutely need to be sorted out. Um, you know, we're more than familiar with, uh, with India's uh, journey um, to essentially clean up its finances with Narendra Modi uh, trying to uh, legislate uh, India out of the, the black market scenario. Um, he, you know, some years ago, as we all know, he tried to cut the use of physical, physical cash uh, in India. Um, so wouldn't CBDC or cryptocurrency actually be a vehicle in which, you know, India could be more transparent, you know, tie with, with more smart contracts um, to be able to be, to have more clarity into, you know, how people are using their money? Sure. So I think, uh, first of all, it's very important for uh, everyone in the industry and the policymakers to understand the nuances between a CBDC versus a cryptocurrency. And I will actually use the word digital assets because digital assets are basically uh, a new form of technology which are not backed by anything. So if you look at the native neutral digital assets like Bitcoin or XRP, they are not backed by anything. They are, they are backed by mathematics. Right? But a stable coin or a CBDC is actually backed by uh, a, a basket of asset classes or fiat currency. So th that's, that's the difference. Now to answer your question, we don't believe digital assets or cryptocurrencies could replace fiat currencies. So uh, uh, I know that in early 2008, 2009, when Bitcoin first came into being, the narrative was down with banks, down with central banks, and Bitcoin will become the, the reserve currency. We don't see that hasn't happened, and we don't see that happening ever. So cryptocurrency digital actually will never become legal tenders. And I think the regulators, policymakers in India are cognizant of that. Now, when it comes to CBDCs, there are two types of CBDCs uh, at a very high level. There is the retail CBDC and then there's the wholesale CBDC. Now, in, the, uh, in a lot of countries, so Sweden, for example, where there has been a big push for digital payments, where almost 80 to 90 percent of uh, payments uh, are non-cash. So for a country like Sweden, it does make sense for the central bank to introduce a retail CBDC where the central bank would issue digital tokens to the entire population. For a country like India, uh, a retail CBDC may not be that feasible because there are many other policy angles related to that, but potentially a wholesale CBDC where the central bank issues tokens to the regulated uh, banks, uh, that could be a possible use case as a complement or a substitute to the already existing fast RTDS system within India. So, so yes, there, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi has been a big advocate for a push towards digital payments. And uh, in the post-COVID world, there will be a bigger push uh, organically. And I think uh, a combination of CBDCs and digital assets could potentially boost that, that, that push towards uh, digital payments, where digital assets will be the, the bridge between uh, fiat currencies instead of potentially replacing them. So, I mean, you work, uh, Sagar, you work a lot with uh, monetary authority in Singapore, uh, uh, familiar with the UK space, um, uh, Naveen, you the same. Uh, if you take a look at this kind of international uh, landscape, who's best positioned right now? The, the policymakers and, and the, the nations that are leading the way. And where does India rank? in your mind? So uh, let's, again, let's take, travel back into time and look at the adoption curve of crypto assets, right? You, it has been a classic innovation cycle that we have seen playing out. So in the early days of crypto, uh, forward thinking regulators, countries like Japan, for example, were the first movers in this space. They came out with frameworks in as early as 2013, 14. So Japan took the lead globally. Uh, and you could argue that was triggered by two potential uh, big hacks and they were really uh, forced into coming up with framework, but that actually acted as a trigger to innovation. And today, Japan, along with a couple of other countries in APAC are the leaders in this space. Then there came the, the phase of fear and uncertainty where after the 2017 boom in crypto, a lot of policymakers, regulators got a little nervous about the, the risks uh, linked with cryptos. So countries like India and, and China uh, introduced blanket bans because they were still trying to figure out how yeah. to regulate this space. 
and then came the and now what we are seeing is the the curve the maturity phase of the innovation cycle life cycle so a lot of countries over the past 12 months including singapore thailand uae mexico they have all come out with very well thought after frameworks to regulate this space uh, and and unlike in the past apac asia pacific has taken the lead globally if you look at southeast asia for example every country singapore malaysia indonesia all the thailand all these countries have introduced frameworks to regulate this new industry and they're already reaping the benefits of it they are seeing a lot of international players coming and setting up shops they are seeing a lot of enterprise use cases of of cryptocurrencies being encouraged and triggered they are seeing a lot of entrepreneurship uh, local entrepreneurship being being developed so they are already reaping the rewards of this uh, so hopefully india will take cues from these countries and and to be again to be very honest uh india uh, has done a lot of innovation in the payment space they they have been leaders in payments innovation for for years now through a lot of initiatives uh but not in the cryptocurrency digital asset space and uh, again they have a huge opportunity with the kind of market india has and the kind of forward thinking regulators india has there's a huge opportunity to introduce a framework in a uh, uh, framework to regulate this space and potentially then start competing with some of the other countries in in asia pacific well that is a very diplomatic way of saying that not yet started where others have already established <laughs> precedents and uh, regulatory framework but i'll i'll say it so you don't have to um but look at the end of the day we you know i want to leave you with this question we have the federal reserve chairman jerome powell uh this past week uh saying that you know when when challenged about the digital dollar and uh digital assets and blockchain and you know what uh digital currency might look like he said that you know this is something for the uh for th the government uh to understand first and best and something that uh the private sector should uh keep keep out of um have you and so you know when you come from from the private enterprise side you know how do you how do you react to that when when government says uh to those in the private sector you know we'll we'll, we'll figure it out we don't need you guys so i think i can i can make a comment first i think there is no difference between the government and the private sector in terms of there is no hard division because at the end of the day the government will make the decision which is which is best for all stakeholders that means institutions in the country for an investor who want to invest in the country and for the consumer at large so in my view having a public consultation to essentially say hey what are the options out there so every voice gets heard and then eventually government makes the best decision is the best of both worlds so nobody is taking the right from the government to make the decision but i think people are asking for the right to be heard to make sure that the best decision gets taken and how, that's how most of the countries evolve that's how most of the good policy have evolved around the world and that's how democracies work and clearly in the case of india there is already a precedent for it and all it needs to be done is replicating that precedent in the digital asset space as well so sagar um what would you say three if you were if you were to say three call to actions in your view what were the most important call to actions for policymakers lawmakers right now in india point number 1 that the the most important thing do not take any action without consulting the stakeholders public private partnership has been a key theme in policy making in india and it should continue to remain so so we urge policymakers to consult the private sector and all stakeholders involved before taking any action that would be my first call to action second would be to see what other countries specifically in apac have done take cues from them around taxonomy how to regulate this which regulatory body will be supervising this new framework and then take a proactive measure which is uh, and introduce a, a a framework which is technology agnostic principles based and risk proportionate uh, and make sure that there is a balance between innovation and risk to kind of encourage more entrepreneurs and and innovation in india and and number 3 would be again india has a huge opportunity so instead of saying blockchain good crypto bad look at this picture more holistically and and understand the the positive use cases of digital assets and cryptocurrencies and then again use that 
to kind of encourage more financial inclusion and, and uh, lower barriers to commerce, push more digital payments, uh, which, has, which, is consistent, which has been a consistent theme in India uh, in Prime Minister's Modi regime. And again, so look at this whole thing holistically. So these would be my three calls to action. To well, I forward. think if one thing it could not be made more abundantly clear is that sometimes the world uh, has different plans for us. And so for all of these central banks who are in the business of uh, you know, trying to manage risk, I think coronavirus and COVID-19 have certainly taught us that there's no amount of managing that could have prepared uh, us for this uh, nearly catastrophic event. Uh, but, but what it also allows for us to see is uh, the opportunities in digital transformation. Uh, certainly cryptocurrency and blockchain is part of that conversation. Uh, and I think uh, to your points, uh, indeed, Naveen and Sagar, you know, more and more of us are, are waking up to the fact that these conversations must be made with, with full transparency, uh, full engagement, uh, and it, it certainly can't be on the ivory tower in, uh, on the hill. It's, uh, we're all on the same boat these days. Um, but I want to thank you so much, uh, both of you, for really kind of giving us uh, not only a perspective from the ground in India, but, you know, all the way to the top in what policymakers uh, must and should be thinking about. Those are very clear call to actions. And I think a lot of uh, foreign investment money is, is betting on it. Um, and more than that, 1.35 billion people are betting on it too. Naveen, Sagar, thank you so much. Uh, that's Naveen Gupta and Sagar Sarbhai from Ripple Asia. I'm your editor in chief forecast news, Angie Lau, and your host of Word on the Block. Thank you for joining us on this latest episode. Until the next time. You know what I'm going to say here, right? Like, comment, subscribe. We hope you do. I'm Editor-in-Chief Angie Lau, Forecast News. Subscribe for a lot more in-depth conversations. This is what we do for you every day. And here's the next one.